since it's preparing. I see a live stream. You see it already? Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Okay, welcome everybody. As everybody gets populated here, we have a tendency to start a minute or two late. So I think we surprised some people by starting exactly on time today. Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of the Big Hearted Warrior Tour, special edition, Social Security. And in today's presentation, we are very happy to be joined by members of the Social Security Administration who will be walking through the application process, the disability evaluation, and a walk through the cardiovascular blue book. For those who joined in the first segment of this session, a lot of people asked, well, what about HCM specifically? So in session one, we talked about who could apply and how do you get enough credits to be a, um, a person eligible for disability uh, social security. And we also explained social security insurance. So there were a couple things in the first session. If you've missed them, I'd encourage you to go back and watch. Today, we are going to be talking about our part two of three and in the next session, um, we will, I'll talk about that in a second, but for today's session, we're one hour, we'll be going for, um, we'll answer questions. We cannot provide consult on your individual case. We can give guidance information through this talk. This information contained in this three-part, potentially four-part now webinar series is not to be used as an individual consultation um, during the session. Individuals' work history, eligibility, disease state will vary greatly, and are, you are each advised to seek consultation from your personal physician and, as necessary, an attorney. The HCMA appreciates our partnership with the Social Security Administration to bring you this information and hopefully work towards demystifying Social Security disability process. Um, the next session will be on March, I'm sorry, May 7th. And this is about the return to work possibilities after you've been on social security uh, disability. Um, if you missed part one, here's a QR code that you might wanna quickly snap a photo of, and that'll tell you a little bit about the first session. And today we are going to have a presentation from Kamal Jobe. He is a social insurance specialist with the Social Security Administration. And he's been on the front end. He's worked on appeals and counsel, uh, as an attorney advisor at, for hearing and appeals analysis. So he's been in the trenches. He's done the thing. He knows what to do. Come on, my dear. I hand the microphone to you. Thank you so much, Lisa. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, if the team wants to just give me a thumbs up that you guys can hear me. Um, excellent. All right, great. So my name is Kamal A. Joe. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I will discuss the Social Security Disability Application Process, as well as the Disability Evaluation. Now, a disclaimer, this presentation will become highly technical and clinically language-driven. So I am not a medical doctor, nor am I presenting as a legal authority on the disability process. This presentation is not a guide to disability, but is a walkthrough of our process and the guidelines of the disability application and evaluation, particularly as it relates to the 4-HCM audience. Next slide, please. Next slide. I don't know if it's changed on. If I'm not changing it. Next slide. Okay, excellent. All right, so Social Security has two monthly benefits programs for people unable to work, that is supplemental security income and Social Security disability insurance. Um, and just to let you guys know, we do have to start a little bit at the beginning before we get into the trenches of the medical um, jargon and evaluation. So this is the beginning, right? So SSDI, which is our Social Security disability insurance, provides a monthly benefit to people who are no longer able to work because of significant disabling conditions. Social Security's disability definition requires you to have a medical condition that prevents you from doing substantial work for at least 12 months or your condition be terminal. This work determination is based on your age, education, and work experience. 
our definition makes the clear distinction between Social Security's disability requirements compared to other disability programs, such as veterans and workmen's compensation. For SSDI, you must have recent work history in order to receive benefits. Adults must have worked and earned Social Security credits in five out of the 10 years prior to the onset of disability. My coworker, uh, Joey, talked a little bit about receiving credits in her presentation last week. For younger workers, however, less work is required. For example, before age 24, one and a half years of work in a three-year period before becoming disabled. Age 24 to 31, you must have worked during half the time between age 21 and the time your disability began. And age 31 or older, you need to have worked during five out of the 10 years before the disability began. Next slide, please. The Supplemental Security Income or SSI program provides monthly benefits to people with disabilities and older adults who have little or no income or resources. So unlike SSDI, you do not need to work and gain, in, and gain insured status for SSI. Therefore, children and older people who have never worked can receive SSI benefits. Social Security has a specific set of rules that apply to disability beneficiaries. If you receive Social Security disability benefits or supplemental security income payments, you must report all earnings to Social Security. Next slide, please. Okay, how do I apply for disability benefits? You can do so in person, by telephone, by mail, or online. The quickest and most convenient way is online. The disability claims interview lasts about one hour. If you're deaf or hard of hearing, you may call our toll-free number at 1-800-325-0778 between 8 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday through Friday. If you schedule an appointment, we'll send you a disability starter kit to help you get ready for your disability claims interview. This starter kit is also available online at ssa.gov backslash disability. You would click on apply for benefit. You have the right to representation by an attorney or other qualified person of your choice when you do business with Social Security. More information is available in your right to representation publication number 05-10075. This is available online from our website at ssa.gov backslash pub, that's P-U-B-S, short for publication. Next slide, please. All right, so let's get into what happens after you've submitted that disability application. Staff at your local Social Security field office will review your non-medical eligibility requirements, such as age, marital status, citizenship, social security coverage, income, and resources. If you meet the non-medical requirements for SSDI, SSI, or both programs, we send your claim or claims up to the State Disability Determination Services, or DDS for short, for evaluation of disability. The DDSs, which are fully funded by the federal government, are state agencies responsible for developing medical evidence and rendering the initial determination as to whether you are disabled or blind under the law. Specifically, the medical examiners work at DDS to make a medical decision on your application. You'll receive notification by mail and your social security office, field office will receive notification electronically. If your claim is approved, you'll start receiving monthly benefits, monthly disability benefits. If denied, you have 60 days to file an appeal. Understand you have 60 days to appeal any decision without good cause, and you must exhaust all administrative remedies prior to seeking civil remedies. After becoming eligible for a disability benefit, the law requires us to conduct a medical review to ensure that the beneficiary, you, still qualify for the program. This generally occurs every three to seven years, depending on the severity of the disability. Next slide, please. Okay, let's talk more about DDS. That initial level of review where your medical evidence and medical records, I should say at this point, we'll call it evidence later on, <laughs> where your medical records first comes in. Uh, they're gonna ask about your doc, they're gonna ask your doctors about your medical conditions, when your medical conditions began, how your medical conditions limit your activities, 
medical test results, and what treatment you've received. They're also going to ask your doctors for information about your ability to do work-related activities, such as walking, sitting, lifting, carrying, and remembering instructions. Your doctors do not decide if you're disabled. However, the more information you provide to your physician, the more they can provide to our offices in the request for information. The state agency staff may need more medical information before they can decide if you're disabled. If your medical sources can't provide needed information, the state agency may ask you to go for a special examination. We prefer to ask your own doctor, but sometimes the exam may have to be done by someone else. Social Security will pay for the exam and for some of the travel-related costs. And we'll talk more about those special exams at the very end of the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. I need you to triple, uh, you're, you're already on it. Two more, there you go. That's, that's, you went too far, that's fine. That, that's good, that's good enough. <laughs> uh, so when that information is received uh, from your physicians, you could think of it being sorted into three ways. You have your medical opinion, objective, and other medical evidence. Now the medical opinion is this defined as a statement from a medical source detailing what the claimant can do, can still do despite your uh, medical condition. If there are limitations on your work activities, such as manipulative, postural, exertional, environmental, that is all included in the medical opinion. Now, objective medical evidence are the science laboratories in, uh, or both, um, which as set forth in our um, regulations, 20 CFR, section 404.1502, subsection F, 404.1513, subsections A1, and the companion um, under SSI, which is 416.902, subsection K, and 416.913, subsections A1. Um, and then, of course, you have other medical evidence. You can click again now. Um, this is evidence from a medical source, including judgments about the nature and severity of your impairment, medical history, clinical notes, diagnosis, treatment prescribed, and prognosis. Um, keep in mind, a medical source is an individual who is licensed as a healthcare worker by a state and working within the scope of their practice permitted under federal or state law, um, or an individual who is certified by the state as a speech language pathologist or a school psychologist acting within state law. If, if the source sending this information is not a medical source, they are evaluated differently under our non-medical source evidence rule. Um, and that's found at 20 CFR, 404.1513. Next slide, please. Okay. Now we're getting into the nitty gritty here. Um, you'll see me take more breaks to drink my water. Uh, so how is the disability determination made, our sequential evaluation process? SSA defines disability as a medical condition that prevents you from doing substantial work for at least 12 months or your condition be terminal. And we use a five-step process to make this disability determination, which is known as our sequential evaluation process or SEP for people who love acronyms. Step one of this process is, are you working, right? Uh, you can't be disabled if you're working. So if you're working and your earnings average more than a certain amount each month, we generally won't consider you eligible for disability benefits. Now this amount changes each year. For the current figure, you'll want to see the annual update, which is publication number 05-1003, but I'll let you know for 2024, that number is $1550, $1,550. If you're not working or your monthly earnings average to the current amount or less, the state agency then looks at your medical condition or they proceed to step two. Is your medical condition severe? For you to be considered to have a disability by Social Security's definition, your medical condition must significantly limit your ability to do basic work activities, such as lifting, standing, walking, sitting, and remembering. Hopefully you remember we just talked about this in terms of that medical opinion um, that your doctor can submit. If your medical condition isn't severe, we won't consider you to be disabled. If your condition is severe, we will proceed to step three. 
Now, step three is where we're going to spend the majority of our um, discussion today. Step three is whether your impairment meets or medically equals a listing. Our list of impairments describes medical conditions that we consider severe enough to prevent a person from completing substantial gainful activity, regardless of age, education, or work experience. If your medical condition or combination of medical conditions isn't on the list, the state agency looks to see if your condition is as severe as the condition on the list. If the severity of your medical condition meets or equals the severity of a listed impairment, the state agency will decide that you have a qualifying disability. If the severity of your condition doesn't meet or equal the severity level of a listed impairment, the state agency goes on to step four. Now, we're not going to talk about steps four and five today. I'm going to mention them quickly, briefly. Um, but I did want to point out that you'll notice that in this step, step three, we talked about if they found, you would be found disabled, right? So this is your first onboarding for disability step, um, which is probably why we were requested to talk more about it today, right? All right, so step four is our past relevant work rule step. Can you do the work you did before? At this step, we decide if your medical impairments prevent you from performing any of your past work. If it doesn't, we'll decide that you don't have a qualifying disability. If it does, we'll proceed to step five. And at step five, unsurprisingly, we discuss, can you do any other type of work, right? If you can't do the work you did in the past, we look to see if there's other work you can do despite your impairment. Here, we do consider your age, education, past work experience, and any skills you may have had, you may have that can be used to do other work. If you can't do other work, we'll decide that you're disabled. And if you can do other work, we'll decide that you do not have a qualifying disability. Please note there are special rules for people who are blind. For more information, ask for if you are blind or have low vision, how we can help publication number 05-10052. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, to be found disabled, the claimant, sorry, I switch into the legal jargon. You cannot be engaging in substantial gainful activity. Substantial gainful activity is used to describe a level of work activity and earnings. The current monthly substantial gainful activity amount, again, is $1,550. It is $2,590 for blind individuals. Therefore, if you're in earning income that exceeds this amount, you will be presumed to be engaging in substantial gainful activity. Does that mean it ends there? You can always submit evidence to prove that you are not. Um, note that this can be part-time work, work involving less responsibility than before, and even illegal work. Yes, illegal work can be counted as substantial gainful activity. Next slide, please. If we proceed to step two, we discuss whether the applicant claimant you um, have severe impairment. A severe impairment is a medical condition that has more than a minimal effect on the individual's capacity to do basic work activities and lasts or is expected to last at least 12 months or more or result in death. Note that this is a medical evidence step. The focus is on medical evidence without regard to your age, education, work experience, or residual functional capacity, which is what you can still do despite your impairment. This is where medical records, hospital reports, discharge summaries, treatment summaries, and psychiatric nursing or other medical professional notes are considered by DDS and at our adjudicatory level. Next slide, please. All right. Um, once we have identified that you are not working and have one or more severe con medical conditions known as impairments, we will evaluate those impairments under the listing for disability. Now, before we delve into the listings, I want to talk, take a beat to talk about a related and important topic, compassionate allowances. Now, compassionate allowances is in that first link above, and you'll see on the screen here that there's a list of three important links. Um, so compassionate allowances is at that first link. Compassionate allowances can direct a finding of disability based on medical findings alone. Um, now, 
sorry, yeah. Um, based on medical findings alone, the medical conditions under compassionate allowances are based on information received at public outreach hearings, comments received from the Social Security and DDS communities, a council of medical and scientific experts, and our research with the National Institutes of Health. There are more than 275 conditions that qualify for expedited disability claim processing through this program. This includes heart transplant graft failure and heart transplant waitlist 1A slash 1B. To learn more and see if you or someone you know qualifies for this program, please visit www.ssa.gov backslash compassionate allowances, all one word, backslash conditions. Now, Social Security has a list of disabilities and medical conditions called the listing of impairments. This describes how severe a condition must be for an adult to be considered disabled by, well, actually it should be an adult or a child to be considered disabled by Social Security. Now keep in mind our medical standards are written by physicians, i.e. it ain't our fault, right? One thing that sets listings apart from compassionate allowances is that listings can have medical equivalents found through other medical conditions not on the listing page based on clinical signs, symptoms, and findings. The listing page is broken into two parts with adult listings covered in part A and childhood listings for individuals under 18 covered in part B. Next slide, please. This is a snapshot of our adulthood adult listing page. The childhood listing page does mirror this. Our listings start with the whole body with the musculoskeletal listed out right. Then we go through special senses and speech. And then we work our way through the body system, starting with respiratory all the way through endocrine. Finally, our listings conclude with congenital, neurological, and mental disorders. Finally, cancers and disorders of the immune system. Now, most individuals are going to have impairments or medical, severe medical conditions that have a combination of these listings, right? I can use myself, for example. I have a bad back, which is diagnosed as lumbar arthritis in my L2 to L4. I also see a therapist for some little anxiety going on, you know? And maybe I have a stomach issue. I don't, but for the sake of this, I have a stomach issue, right? So I would have evaluations under listing one for musculoskeletal, listing five for digestive, and listing 12 for the anxiety, right? So that's how that works. Keep in mind that only severe impairments are considered here, therefore non-diagnosed conditions or impairments with no ongoing limitations are not going to be considered under the listing of impairments. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, we're about to get into the listing language. And something that's very, very important is uh, your preamble to your, to your listing language. And so here I've extracted some important terms to guide you through reading the listing, which we're about to do. Um, you can find this language, again, on that blue book link that I mentioned at the top. Um, specifically, this is under listing 4.00. A, subsection three. So, um, unsurprisingly, a consecutive 12-month period is a period of 12 consecutive months, all or part of which must occur within the period we are considering in connection with your application or continuing disability review application. Persistent, as we use it, means that with few exceptions, required findings have been present or expected to be present for a continuous period of at least 12 months, such that a pattern of continuing severity is established. Recurrent means that a longitudinal clinical record shows that within a, within a consecutive 12-month period, the findings occur at least three times with intervening periods of improvement of sufficient duration, excuse me, that it's clear that separate events are involved. You're gonna see a brilliant example of this in one of the listings uh, that we go through today. Appropriate medically acceptable imaging. This is, it just means technique used that's proper to evaluate and diagnose um, 
and commonly recognized. And I'm, I'm sure anyone familiar with a physician's office knows a ton of medical imaging that have been done. Um, and of course, uncontrolled means that the impairment or the medical condition does not adequately respond to standard prescribed medical treatment. Next slide, please. Okay, so what does Social Security mean by ca cardiovascular impairment? We mean any disorder that affects the proper functioning of the heart or the circulatory system, that is the arteries, veins, capillaries, and the lymphatic drainage. This disorder can be congenital or acquired. Cardiovascular impairment results from one or more, one or more of four consequences to heart disease. One, chronic heart failure or ventricular dysfunction. Two, discomfort or pain due to myocardial ischemia with or without necrosis of heart muscle. Three, syncope or near syncope due to inadequate cerebral perfusion from any cardiac cause, such as obstruction of flow or disturbance in rhythm or conduction resulting in an adequate cardiac output. And four, central cyanosis due to, left, due to right to left shunt, reduced oxygen concentration in the arterial blood or pulmonary vascular disease. Now, what do we consider in evaluating cardiovascular impairments? The listings in the section describe cardiovascular impairments based on symptoms signs, laboratories, response to regimen of the prescribed treatment, and functional limitations. Next slide, please. And can I get a, thank you. All right, for people in the 4HCM community, two important conditions are discussed that are relevant to our listings, which are chronic heart failure and recurrent arrhythmias. We'll visit the signs and symptoms described in 4.00D2 in detail, then we'll address the requirements of both A and B. That's what you need to meet the listing under 4.02. Next, we will discuss what are arrhythmias not related to reversible causes, such as electrolyte abnormalities, digitalis glycoside, or antiarrhythmic drug toxicity, resulting in uncontrolled recurrent episodes of cardiac syncope or near syncope despite prescribed treatment and documented by resting or ambulatory. Okay, um, ambulatory um, electrocardiography or by other appropriate medically acceptable testing coincident with the occurrence of syncope or near syncope. As you recall, we already discussed what recurrent, uncontrolled, and acceptable medical imaging means, so I don't need to re-explain that. This information that you see on your screen is actually on your 4-HCM website under Social Security Disability in the USA. So shout out to the 4-HCM team for having this information available. Note that heart transplants are evaluated under 4.09 and you are considered under a disability for one year following that surgery. Chronic venous insufficiency and peripheral arterial disease are covered in 4.11 and 4.12, respectively. Ischemic heart disease is covered in 4.04, and congenital is covered in 4.06. Next slide, please. Okay, so for chronic heart failure, otherwise known as CHF, uh, there are two main types. Um, now, Chronic heart failure is described as the inability of the heart to pump enough oxygenated, oxygenated blood to body tissues. This syndrome is characterized by symptoms and signs of pulmonary or systemic congestion, fluid retention, or limited cardiac output. Certain laboratory findings of cardiac functional and structural, abnorm structural abnormality support the diagnosis of CHF. And we're going to discuss those right now. Well, actually in the next slide. Um, first, we need to touch on the two main types of chronic heart failure, predominant systolic and predominant diastolic. Predominant systolic is the inability of the heart to contract normally and expel sufficient blood. This is characterized by dilated, poorly contracting left ventricle and reduced ejection fraction, which is abbreviated EF. This represents the percentage of blood in the ventricle actually being pumped out with each contraction. Predominant diastolic dysfunction is the inability of the heart to relax and feel normally. This 
is characterized by a second ventricular muscle, poor ability of the left ventricular to descend, increased ventricular filling pressure, and a normal or increased ejection fraction. Keep in mind, chronic heart failure, CHS, CHF, is considered in these listings as a single category, whether due to after, mm, I practice this word, atherosclerosis, cardiomyopathy, hypertension, or rheumatic congenital heart disease. Next slide, please. All right. Let's start with the laboratory findings needed for cardiac function to show cardiac functional and structural abnormality needed to support chronic heart failure. They're summarized here on the screen. I will discuss in detail, cardiomegaly or ventricular dysfunction must be present or demonstrated by appropriate medically acceptable imaging, such as the chest X-ray, echocardiography, radionuclide studies, or cardiac catheterization. Um, abnormal cardiac imaging showing increased left ventricular and diastol diastolic diameter, decreased ejection fraction, increased left atrial chamber size, increased ventricular filling pressures measured at card cardiac catheterization, or increased left ventricular wall or septum thickness. At two, you have uh, left ventricular and diastolic diameter greater than six centimeters or an ejection fraction of 30% or less during a period of stability, that is during not acute heart failure. This may be associated clinically with systolic failure. Left ventricular posterior wall thickness added to septal thickness totaling 2.5 centimeters or greater with left atrium enlarged to 4.5 centimeters or greater may be associated with diastolic failure. Note that the measurements alone do not reflect your functional capacity, which we evaluate by considering all of the relevant evidence. In some situations, we may need to purchase an exercise tolerance test to help us assess your functional capacity. Other findings on appropriate medically acceptable imaging may include increased pulmonary vascular markings, pleural effusion, and pulmonary edema. These findings need not be present on each report since chronic heart failure may be controlled with prescribed treatment. Next slide, please. Okay, we've now talked about the signs and symptoms for heart failure. Now we're gonna establish chronic heart failure. To establish that you have chronic heart failure, you need medical history and physical examination to describe characteristic symptoms and signs of pulmonary or systemic congestion or of limited cardiac output associated with abnormal findings on appropriate medically acceptable imaging. Symptoms of congestion or limited cardiac output include easy fatigue, weakness, shortness of breath, otherwise known as dyspnea, cough or chest discomfort at rest or with activity. Individuals with chronic heart failure may also experience shortness of breath on lying flat or episodes of shortness of breath that wake them from their sleep. They may also experience cardiac arrhythmias resulting in palpitations, lightheadedness, or fainting. Signs of congestion may include hepatomegaly, hepo, ah, these words, hepatomegaly, ascite, increased jugular venous distension or pressure, rails, peripheral edema, or rapid weight gain. However, as always, these signs need not be found on all examinations. When an acute episode of heart failure is triggered by a remedial factor, such as arrhythmia, dietary, dietary sodium overload, or high altitude, cardiac function may be restored and a chronic impairment may not be present. In other words, if you get heart fluttering for certain situations, then it's not really evidencing um, cardiac malfunction, right? Um, if you can be restored pretty easily. Next slide, please. Okay, so sorry for the font on this. It was really the only way to get it on the screen. Um, and these are snapshots again from our Blue Book listing. Um, so we've talked about the signs and symptoms and the medical history needed to establish chronic heart failure. Now we can turn to the listing itself to see how you would then meet or equal the listing. 
So once you have established chronic heart failure, once you have established heart failure through the appropriate medical imaging, documenting cardiomegaly or ventricular function, and established chronic heart failure through medical history and physical examination in the longitudinal record, you need one from column A and one from column B to meet the listing. I will summarize starting with column B. You need a medical professional to say that you are too limited to perform an exercise test, or you have recurrent episodes of heart failure despite treatment with evidence of fluid retention during episodes and requiring acute extended physician intervention for 12 hours or more, separated by a period of stabilization. This period could be at least two weeks between episodes of acute heart failure, where there's evidence that the pulmonary edema or pleural effusions had cleared, or you were good to return to normal activity. In essence, your episodes need to be separated by periods of doing better. Um, and we look at that as two weeks between. And finally, at column three, you attempt an exercise test, but you cannot complete it due to dyspnea, fatigue, palpitations, or three or more consecutive premature ventricular contractions, or decrease of 10 millimeters of mercury or more to solid blood pressure. Um, other signs may be attributed like inadequate cerebral perfusion, ataxic gait, or mental confusion. They may also determine you cannot complete the exercise test. Now, so if you have one from side B, you need one from side A. Um, the A side are the objective clinical tests that are needed to support the systolic or diastolic failure. That is systolic with left ventricular and diastolic dimensions greater than 6.6, 6 .6 centimeters, ejection fraction of 30% or less during a period of stability or diastolic with left ventricular posterior wall plus septal thickness totaling 2.5 centimeters or greater on imaging with an enlarged late atrium greater than or equal to 4.5 centimeters with that normal or elevated ejection fraction during period of stability. Next slide, please. We could get a double click here. All right, so we just went through chronic heart failures. Let's discuss recurrent arrhythmias. This is a bit more straightforward, thankfully. <laughs> Um, uh, for arrhythmias not related to reversible causes, such as external or non-cardiac causes, resulting in uncontrolled recurrent episodes of syncope or near syncope, despite prescribed treatment and documented by appropriate medically acceptable testing coincident with the occurrence of syncope. I think this is pretty straightforward. Excuse me. Note that this listing only applies when the arrhythmias are not fully controlled by medication, an implanted pacemaker, or an implanted cardiac defibrillator. Um, and you have uncontrolled recurrent episodes of syncope or near syncope. That's when we'll evaluate under this listing. Next slide, please. All right, so what is an arrhythmia? An arrhythmia is an irregular change in the heart. Uh, your heart may seem to skip your heart may seem to skip a beat or beat irregularly very quickly. It's called tachycardia. Very slowly, it's called bradycardia. There are many types of arrhythmias. Arrhythmias are identified by where they occur in your heart, whether it's the atrial or the ventricle, um, and by what happens to your heart's rhythm when they occur. Arrhythmias arising in the cardiac atria, which are the upper chambers of the heart, are called atrial or supraventricle arrhythmias. Ventricular arrhythmias beginning in the ventricles or the lower chambers, um, these are generally caused by heart disease and are considered the most serious. Next slide, please. Okay. So the result of your arrhythmia needs to either be syncope or near syncope episodes. You can't just have the arrhythmia with no resulting consequence, so to speak, um, and, and have a chance to be onboarded uh, here uh, at this listing, right? So you'll notice here um, the language in 4.00 F3C relies heavily on documented association between the symptom, that is the syncope, and the disorder, which is the arrhythmia. Documentation means that the objective evidence we talked about way early on such as the laboratory findings, medical histories, 
uh, diagnoses and medical opinions support that the syncope is being caused by the arrhythmia. Again, if your arrhythmias are controlled, we will evaluate your underlying heart disease using the appropriate listing. For other considerations, when we evaluate arrhythmias in the presence of an implanted cardiac defibrillator, please see 4.00F4. Given the further technical details involved with that listing, I'm not going to cover it in this session. Next slide, please. All right, so earlier I mentioned special exams. If you didn't have enough evidence, here we are. So you may not have received ongoing treatment or have an ongoing relationship with the medical dis community despite the existence of severe impairments. Excuse me. Unless we can decide your claim favorably on the basis of the current evidence, a longitudinal record is still important. Therefore, if the evidence provided by the claimant's own medical sources is inadequate to determine if they are disabled, additional medical information may be sought by recontacting the medical source for additional information or clarification, or by arranging for a consultative examination. The consultative examination is an independent medical examination paid for by Social Security. We may often send you to one of these to help establish the severity and the duration of your impairment. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, this is an uh, image I pulled from the internet. This is not on our, the information I'm gonna present is from um, Social Security, but the picture isn't. I don't want there to be confusion. Okay, so due to the unique relationship between the heart and lungs, there are symptoms that appear in both 3.00 and 4.00 listings, right? Specifically, shortness of breath, fatigue, dyspnea, right? It is important if you are experiencing these symptoms, particularly if they are impacting your activities of daily living, you should be reporting them to your medical professional. The impact on daily living due to fatigue and shortness of breath was considered in 4.02b. Remember your symptoms are evaluated under their impairment. So the shortness of breath or fatigue will be evaluated under the medically determinable impairment and the accompanying listing. Um, so for example, if you have asthma causing it, you will be evaluated on your 3.0 listings. But if it's your arrhythmia or your heart disease, then it's going to be evaluated under your cardiovascular um, listing. Next slide, please. All right, we made it to the end. Um, so in summary, we covered the categories of monthly disability benefits, the disability application process, the disability evaluation process, known as the sequential evaluation process, important terms in the cardiovascular listings, chronic heart failure and the arrhythmia listings, which are relevant to the 4-HCM community, the importance of a treatment and longitudinal record, and related listings like uh, respiratory, um, which stresses the importance of documenting the symptoms and communicating that to your medical professional. Next slide, please. So we have time for a short Q&A. Um, sorry, well, I'm not sorry. It's a long presentation because there was a lot of information. Um, but uh, we do have time for a short Q&A. If there's anything I cannot get to, um, I will go back and we'll try to get an answer for you. Um, the email you see here is our communications team. And again, that Blue Book website, which is on the 4HCM website, but also on your screen right now is... Um, something you should really save because uh, it's what medical professionals are using or supposed to be using um, when, when you know, evaluating your uh, condition. And that is it. So thank you for your time today and I'll answer um, some questions. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop the share so we can just kind of go into Brady Bunch here. So a couple of things I want to bring up um, while we're waiting for some questions to percolate through here. If you are watching on Facebook, we were having some technical issues with Facebook earlier, so I did not announce. We are not taking Q&A from Facebook, only from the Zoom room. If one of my team could drop the link into the Facebook group, if you want to jump in here real quick and ask a question, there's still a couple minutes, so you can still join us. Okay, so 
Um, number one, I, I found a little thing that needs maybe some updating in your compassionate use or compassionate, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, compassionate allowance conditions, which yeah. just, we could talk about this offline, but it lists heart transplantation, 1A, 1B. That scale is only now used for pediatrics, not adults. So the 1A, 1B is no longer active and it hasn't been since 2018. So I'm not quite sure exactly where um, a, a listed adult heart transplant recipient might be eligible for compassionate allowance. The 1A, 1B were taken away and it's a 1, 2, 3, 4. There's no A's and B's anymore. So um, maybe we could get some clarification from your team behind the, the veil at SSI uh, to see if we can get some clarification on, is it only for children? Or is it for children and adults? And if it's adults, what's the listing criteria? Because a one for an adult now basically means you're on ECMO. So you're on support and it's the sickest of the sick. And they're trying not to let anybody get to a one. They should transplant okay. as twos or threes. So uh, I don't I don't have an answer to that. I just have a question and maybe we can. Yeah, I, I could take that back. Yeah, that's, um, I'm not I, asking you, I'm asking the, the bigger yeah. enterprise. <laughs> so we you. have a question from one of our participants. Is there a time frame for expected death from cardiovascular? Um, no, what do you no? I mean, if your doctor, if 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 the if it's an impairment, so when we say expected, ex, I don't even like the terminology yeah, around it. But when we when we say expected to result in death, we mean that the, a medical professional has said, you know, this this. It, this untreated will kill you, or this is going to kill you. You will die from that. I mean, that sounds so bleak and somber, but no, there's no like, it doesn't need to be like, you're going to die in six months. If that's what I think, I'm guessing that's what the person's asking. You're no, it's, it's just, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This isn't yeah. like, oh, I have to wait until I'm within a year of death to apply. Don't do that. Um, like, no, um, it's just if the impairment is expected. To result in death, uh, but no, there's no timeline attached to to when you're expected to die now. So, in the face of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and, and you did pretty well on some of those uh, scientific terms there. <laughs> Thank so you. Well done, you. I was doing the speak and spell earlier. So I'm uh, that that makes sense. So, when we're dealing with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the majority of people will live to or surpass the average age of mortality. But there are some who develop true disability as it relates to their diagnosis. Some of those individuals will have the opportunity to be listed for a heart transplant, and some will be disabled but don't meet the qualifications for transplant. It is a really awkward space to be in, and we're trying to resolve some of the guidance and, and make it a little easier for patients to get from one place to another. So in the event that you're told that you have HCM and there are no other options for you and they're offering you palliative care, um, transplant's not an option for whatever the reason. It could be you have a coexisting blood disorder that makes transplant really challenging. So that would be one set of people and it's very rare, it's a very rare group of people. And there are some people who are really having a hard time managing their symptoms. It doesn't mean that disability is their destination but it may be a resting point for a while until you can get your health optimized, either through surgery, medications, a combination of the two. So it's how sick you are, how well this is documented. And then we get into the confusion with, well, I feel fine, but I have this massive arrhythmia burden. And depending upon the type of arrhythmia and how frequently you're in that arrhythmia and how much it's impacting your quality of life, then you may qualify for disability as well. Social Security Disability specifically. I'm aware of a number of you right now that are in process of trying to get disability. Some of you have been declined on your first attempt. So I'm going to ask Kamal, if somebody has submitted their documentations and they were told, no, you don't meet qualifications. We know that there's an appeal process, but what do you think is going on as to why somebody who's really not well, why wouldn't they get okay? Is it documentation? Very often it is documentation. Um, when I was in the appeals council, we did there. There was a number of times where we had to reevaluate 
how we evaluated medical opinion. Um, very often you might have a disconnect and, and we're not, no one's perfect. Every, every, every individual is an individual, right? Every case is different. Um, and at the outset of this, you know, I was very clear on our definition of disability. It is when your medical condition prevents you from engaging in what we consider substantial work activity, right? And, and, you know, what you're, and Lisa has done a brilliant job, thank you so much, at explaining what you can still do despite, again, I have back anxiety, plenty of issues, but I can still work, right? Like I have, I have a gaming chair, I haven't gamed in my entire life, but that's an accommodation I made so that I'm able to sit for long periods, right? So like when we talk about disability, we're saying essentially like even without accommodations, you wouldn't be able to work, right? So, so it is important that when we when we talk about documentation and you didn't get that initial approval, very often, yeah, there might be there's something in your file that doesn't suggest that you're completely unable to work. There's something in your file suggesting that if you sit down for a few hours, you can get up and work again. You know what I mean? Like if you do a sit stand job, you know. So it really is about, and that's why we I stress. Um, communicating to your medical professional what you're experiencing. You know, I am personally someone who is guilty of underplaying my conditions when I go to their doctor because I don't, I guess it's a man thing. I don't know. Um, oh, no, it's, it's, a like, human thing. it's a human it's thing. It's a human thing, right? So, so, it, so don't do that, right? Um, I'm not saying exaggerate it, that that's not going to serve your purpose either, but um, be honest. If you're, if you're experiencing shortness of breath every time you go up the stairs, say that, you know, if you're, if the only thing you can do after standing for 15 minutes is sit down, then say that because the doctor is not going to write it if they don't know it and we're not going to know it. And we, and it's better for us if a medical professional is saying it versus the person, right? Um, it's, it's just the way it is, right? Um, but yeah, that, that would be my, that would be my first stop um, in terms of Hey, I really think I am disabled. Why? Why didn't I get approved? I would. I would make sure. Hey, have I talked to my doctor about everything? Has he documented everything? I'm pretty sure you can see your own medical documents. Um, and 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 yeah, I think that's a great place to start. So I will say that in a particular case that I'm looking at right now to help somebody through the process, the community doctor has not really been documenting the HCM very well. So bringing in an HCM specialist to really evaluate not only what the treatment options might be, but the current state of affairs is very, very important. And I think that's why this individual was turned down. I don't think the documentation really supported mm -hmm. his lived experience. So it's yeah. really important that you document the lived experience. If mm -hmm. you are rejected on appeal, I recommend getting a very good lawyer not necessarily the ones that advertise the most, but the yeah. ones that really are social security disability experts. And you're not one of 20,000 cases, it's a smaller practice where they can get to know you a little bit more and they can advocate for you better. So um, I'm trying to, direct, to, to get a list of those attorneys available, but they vary by state and region so much, it's very hard to collect that. So you're going to have to do a little bit of your own digging on that, but we're happy to communicate information about HCM to your chosen uh, representative, whoever that might be. Um, but I can't tell you enough how important it is to get a specialist evaluation. Um, oftentimes, yeah. the local guys just don't have all the tools in the toolbox to know how to make and, them feel better. And yeah. Well, and I was going to say, uh, you know, I talked about the CEs earlier, but um a lot of times, and we, and again, I mentioned we're all human. A lot of people are overworked. A lot of people are stressed. Uh, a lot of times people just forget to put certain things in, write certain things down. Um, there's nothing stopping you from talking to your doctor about your disability application and saying, hey, like, this should be coming through. You know, I just want to make sure you're aware and we're on the same page. And, um, and again, I have to go, we didn't cover it this that in, in this session because we didn't have time, but that RFC piece, that that what you can do despite your impairments is so significant. I can't undersell the significance of that. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of times 
we can feel like we can't do something, but you know, if it, if it's not documented, it's it's you know, and and in terms of the list thing that. I will say for the 4HCM community, and I'm sorry, I know we're running low on time, but we'll say for the 4HCM community, um, I think that, the, the, not I think, documentation is a hundred times more important because cardiovascular out of all of our listings, and I, if I could share my screen, I'd show you guys, has the most preamble language. Like you scroll down for sections before you get to the actual listing. Why? Because it's very diagnostically driven, extremely diagnostically driven. You basically meet the listings when someone sees on your record, they were in the hospital this time, this time, this time, this long, this long, this long. You know, stuff like that is going to make it very clear in terms of listing. Um, but, you know, as we, as Lisa said, um, absent that, that year of the transplant, and don't forget, you do get that year of disability with the transplant, but um, outside of that, it, it is expected that you kind of return to some, some level of functioning where you're able to, to resume work activity. Yeah. And for some transplant patients, that's possible. And for some, it doesn't happen. And, and they say, Right. Yeah. In which case, you submit that application. You say, hey, my transplant was over a year ago. And yes, my disability has ended. But I need you guys to look at my application. Look at this documentation. I'm still not able to stand more than 15 minutes without losing my breath. Yeah. You know, that, like stuff that like that. That can definitely happen. One of the questions that we, we actually have two questions, one coming through the chat box here and some through the Q&A. <clears throat> Maureen's classifying just the risk of sudden death in HCM. Is that something that would qualify because we can be asymptomatic but have a high risk of cardiac arrest? And I would answer no. That is not part of your functional capacity. It's an outcome that might happen. And if it happened once, it's not likely to happen many more times, but you've got your defibrillator there as therapy to protect you, but it doesn't necessarily buy you a ticket out of the workplace. Would that be a good way? I, I think that's fairly accurate. I mean, I, I honestly can't like speak for the agency on that because again, our listings and all that stuff are developed with a lot of medical community involved. Um, but that I, I believe what you said is correct because it's not a functional capacity. It's just a possible outcome. Um, and it sounds almost like an immeasurable function, uh, possible outcome. Like there's no way to really know how or when it would happen. So, um, yeah, I, I think, I think what you said sounds, sounds good. It sounds about right. Okay. One last yeah. question and then we'll wrap for the day with our, with our gratitude. If somebody applies and is declined, is there a time limit? for reapplying or when do you appeal and when do you reapply? So you have 60 days to appeal the decision um, and that's at any level uh, for social security. Well, I don't want to expand. Anyway, for social security, you have 60 days um, to to appeal uh, the, the decision. Um, and it's pretty easy to file an appeal. They usually give you the paperwork when they decline or deny your um, application. So you do that. If you miss that 60 days and you don't have a good reason, like I moved and I didn't see the paperwork or my attorney never contacted me, um, then yes, you would have to reapply. But understand that reapplying, because you didn't move on that, now we're getting into the law. I'm getting into my legal brain of it. Because you didn't um, file an appeal on that, chances are that period is now closed for consideration. So if you are to apply, last month for 2015 through 2018 disability and you sorry not last month three months ago and you didn't appeal the decision um and 60 days have passed when you refile and that were i shouldn't say refile when you file a new application there's a good chance you're no longer going to be able to claim for that period because of judicial um uh, jurisprudence um but that's getting into the weeds. But yes, uh, just keep in mind 60 days is just a file your appeal within 60 days and you're good to go. That's the safest thing. Um, if you miss that, then like Lisa said, get a very good lawyer because there are ways to get that period back. But um, 
it's not straightforward. So, yeah. I would definitely recommend a first attempt on your own. If you fail, then go to an attorney. Um, you don't necessarily always need the attorney up front. So that could save you a little bit of uh, trouble. Yeah. But um, I think HCMA is going to take on a little project and try to create a checklist of sorts for a community to know, mm -hmm. okay, here are the elements that I'm having a problem with. Here's my documentation of that. And if we just document more effectively, I think it'll help a lot of you get through the um, the process more easily or understand that this isn't the process for you at this mm -hmm. time. So if the data doesn't match, but you also could have another coexisting condition that's also coming into mm -hmm. play. So then you'd have to go yeah. through a checklist of all of the things you need to prove that disability and the other disability. And then we leave it in the hands of SSDI to make the determination that as a combination of A and yeah. B, it yeah. A is worse than a regular A yeah. would be because you've got B there confounding it. Yeah. So, that, a, a, very, a very quick example of that is if you have like heart problems and a mental condition, they can both impact your ability to concentrate, you know, and that reduces your functional capacity. So great, great, great example. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Okay. Well, Stacy and Julie, who've been backstage taking care of things through this very chaotic technologically complicated morning. Um, thank you for your help in this webinar and hopefully we'll get Zoom to start working normally again. Something has happened with Zoom and Facebook streaming that we're confounded with at the moment. So sorry if there's any people who missed the last session. We found out about it in the last session. We thought it was fixed. It was kind of fixed, but we're getting there. So join us on the 7th of May for the third installment of our talk with the Social Security Administration. At the HCMA, we thank you for your partnership, Social Security Administration, and the entire team. And Kamal, thank you very much. And I'm going to give you one, one note from this process. Syncope, syncope. Most people in the cardiac space will call it syncope. When you're not in the okay. cardiac space, you'll call it syncope. So uh, there man. you go. You can sound like an insider now and call it syncope. See, I didn't try that one because I assumed I was right. I was like, I don't need to practice this one. All right. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Thanks so much for everybody joining us today and have a great day and join us at the next session. Thanks and goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Stacey, you can stop streaming on Facebook. Hit the top button. <laughs>